begin again. Um, uh, you will now hear a lecture from uh, Professor Primoz Grasiewicz. He works uh, on this faculty uh, at the Department of Sociology. Um, he will try to put uh, the things, the processes, uh, things happening in different countries into a, a wider context. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for your invitation. Um, I will first present a short and necessarily, because short, simplified uh, analysis of the um, basic uh, connections between uh, changes and processes happening in the higher education and society and economy at large. It will be, um, also this presentation will be simplified due to the fact uh, of me hoping for it to be useful outside of. Uh, strictly uh, Slovenian context, so to, to, to provide you with some, let's say, tools of analysis which could also be applied to other, other national contexts uh, or uh, higher education uh, reforms, processes, um, both problematic and positive in other, other countries. So, in order to, uh, to make it as simple and clear as possible, I divide it in, in four parts. First, I will focus on the uh, changes in the study process uh, itself. Next, on the changes in uh, teaching and research in university as an institution at large. And then, uh, then I will switch to a perspective of interrelation between uh, university and society at large, and I will uh, conclude with a sketch of a positive, uh, a sketch of a positive alternative. So, as to not as usually happens in such events, just present a, a critique of the state of things as um, they are taking our money away from us. Please do not, uh, please stop uh, taking uh, money away from us. But also to provide some kind of a, a, a positive, at least as in this, uh, some kind of a sketchy way of uh, a positive alternative. So, uh, to begin uh, with the study process, um, um, I think it can be the basic problem of the changes in the in the from the students' perspective or the perspective of the position of students and what they're supposed to do and what they actually do during their time in the university. I think most of the problems can be traced back to, to Bologna reform or uh, related, uh, related or Bologna-inspired changes in the, in the study process. Um, and I'm thinking about the things that you're, uh, all of you are probably very well aware of and experience them on your own skin in your everyday uh, student life. So the first is the uh, the overload of uh, or the in increase uh, uh, unmanageable increase of uh, student workload. So with Bologna reform, uh, not not only are um, the the amount of courses increases, but also the length of specific courses and also the uh, things that are expected and demanded uh, from student to do to pass each course. So. Uh, not only do we have uh, uh, a few years after the introduction of Bologna reform, not only uh, we have exams, but we also have seminar works, uh, presentations, and so on, which are not, of course, which are not bad things uh, in themselves. Um, of course, it's, it's okay uh, for students to, to write uh, seminar papers, to learn how, how to write, how, how to express themselves, how to structure uh, um, how to use academic argumentation uh, quotation and so on, but when it becomes an, uh, when it becomes from a teaching tool an end to itself, so this endless production of, of short texts which are basically little more than just uh, a reproduction of teaching material. So you read the text and then in the next day or in a few days you're supposed to, to produce, uh, produce a text on it. Um, it kind of defeats the purpose because you, you don't really learn anything, you just learn some, um, some very pragmatic tools of, of how, to, how to write this increasing amount of these texts without any, let's say, in-depth studying of the text you're supposed to uh, write, write upon. So this, uh, this um, amount, this increasing amount of, of student work basically uh, what it produces in practice is the development 
or very cynical, very pragmatic strategies of uh, student survival. So basically, basically you learn the ropes. You you know how to, um, or you are, you are forced to learn how to present your seminar works as um, with as little work as possible because you have seminar works in in other courses and the amount of courses of course increased with uh, Bologna reform so basically <coughs> as a student you learn this cynical pragmatic tactics of just just meeting meeting the targets of, of your workload without actually doing uh, any work so um, uh, uh, I'm hoping not or if I'm exaggerating I'm doing it for uh, polemical purposes of course not not each and every student accept this cynical way but uh, every student has to accept it if if he or she wants to pass, if he wants to uh, meet this uh, increased uh, uh, workload. Uh, so, so the the basic effect is not not only that students are overburdened, but this oh, this the the sole effect of uh, them being overburdened uh, diminishes the the quality of uh, study study uh, process and. Um, uh, it, in the end, it amounts. If you look at the student work as a whole, it amounts to the over over production of uh, more or less uh, irrelevant uh, irrelevant seminar works, and also increases the the teachers' workload. So, so it's kind of like self reproducing uh, spiral that basically leads to nothing more than overwork on on both sides, both for students and and uh, teachers and leaves little room and energy and space and time for any actual quality, uh, quality pedagogic or teaching or studying, uh, studying work. So uh, necessarily a uh, qualitative side of, of both teaching and studying, studying is being, uh, being uh, uh, neglected. So uh, I think this is um, this this change in the study process. I think is the main problem, or at least I see it as the main problem uh, um, from the student side. Um, and another another problem is also the diminishing either dimin the diminishing amount of uh, or diminishing availability of student stipends uh, coupled with the increasing necessity for, for students to work to, to maintain themselves financially during their time of study. So increasing, teacher, increasing studying load is coupled with uh, increasing workload outside the, uh, outside the uh, university which is of course connected to the general at least in Slovenia but probably things are uh, very similar in other European countries, this increasing pressure on students to work to maintain themselves is of course, to, uh, of course connected to wider economic situation with, with ri rising uh, youth uh, unemployment and the, the spread of precarious uh, or post for this uh, um, forms of work uh, of this un unstable short term or part time uh, part time employment and also uh, at least in Ljubljana this this problem is, um, is especially pronounced the problem of exploding rent uh, rents to, to rent your own apartment and of course uh, the the students students accommodation or student housing does not meet the demand so a lot of students are either by choice or by uh, forced by the unavailability of student housing uh, to, to search room with uh, private providers where rents can be really extortionate. So this, this again increases the, the necessity for students to work, which, uh, which from the outside um, diminishes uh, the possibilities for qual uh, quality in depth uh, studying. So from the, from the other side, from the side of teachers and uh, researchers, uh, the effects of the Bologna reform are quite similar, or not. Um, so the, the process is the same, it just affects uh, people who teach, who work and research at the university in a different way. Um, uh, um, from teachers or researcher perspective, Bologna reform is, is even worse because uh, from students' perspective, it's still, uh, uh, however it is, it's still just a period in, in your life. You, you spend three years or four years or five or six years, uh, whatever amount of years, 
at the university and then you can go on with your life. But if you work at the university and if you have this uh, rare, uh, uh, increasingly uh, rare opportunity to get a stable employment contract, then it's your destiny. So, so you have to meet this increasing, uh, increasing work, uh, workload, this quantification, this um, completely, um, completely unchecked expansion of both administrative uh, workload and teaching workload, uh, it becomes your destiny. You meet it day after day, uh, year after year. And again, if you're lucky enough to, to get a stable uh, employment, uh, employment contract. So from the uh, perspective of teachers and assistants, um, decreasing amount of, of courses also means you have to, you have to do more lectures. Uh, uh, you have to teach more hours, which of course leaves you uh, with less time uh, for quality uh, preparation. And it kind of also forces you to sooner or later uh, uh, abandon maybe your idealistic views uh, um, on what the teaching profession uh, could and should be and adopt some uh, cynical pragmatic strategy. So you either uh, repeat the same things uh, in different courses or, or you use your PowerPoints from previous years in all the next years. So there, there's a structural uh, pressure for the um, uh, for uh, individual individual teachers and researchers to also adapt some some kind of uh, cynical strategies uh, cynical strategies of survival which of course um, also diminish the, the quality of teaching but also from the side of the teachers and uh, researchers uh, but also on the side of the teachers there's also increasing um, administrative pressure uh, which forces you to, to also uh, meet quantitative targets uh, and constant evaluations and re-evaluations uh, um, re of your work uh, by, by collecting uh, different, different type of academic points. So, so it's basically it's, it's uh, quantitative uh, administrative uh, um, measures and methods of, of control and uh, discipline, disciplinary uh, mechanisms to, to keep teachers uh, in line. But the, the, problem, the problem is, as, as you can probably guess, uh, the problem is this paradoxical situation. So you do not have uh, or basic, basic conditions to do quality research and quality teaching, so to take time to really fully prepare for, for each and every uh, lecture, uh, to try to be productive, so not to say uh, uh, the same things from year to year, but let's say change topics, include new literature, new, new research, expand your horizon. This is being uh, maybe not systematically destroyed, but uh, at the very least systematically uh, limited. So quality of your work necessarily diminishes, at least to, at least to a degree, you can of course um, uh, uh, hyper exploitate your, yourself and do, do individual heroism, but this also goes to at the expense of your, of your uh, as every teacher is probably aware, this goes at the expense of your free time, your social life, your, your uh, family, family life. Um, the, 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 the structural possibility to do quality teaching and research inside your work time is, is, uh, is uh, quite limited. So as, your, uh, as, as the possibility of doing quality teaching and research uh, uh, diminishes, so, so does uh, the administrative pressure to, to, be, to be productive, to write, to, um, uh, to publish and so on increases. So, uh, um, the, the, the lesser your possibility to, to actually discover something, to, to actually find out something and take the necessary time to think it through and write a quality article, the more uh, the pressure to, to publish. So, um, uh, uh, so the, this administrative pressure in, the, in, in, um, in some way uh, wants to uh, at least uh, on the declarative level, tries to tries to offset the negative effects of the increasing workload, but does it without removing the the, the whole systemic changes 
that diminish the, the, the quality of the teaching and uh, research works. So basically in practice it, it amounts to, to pure administrative disciplinary uh, pressure and also in this um, the, the way how individual teachers and research try to, researchers try to cope uh, with this administrative pressure is basically uh, to, to copy paste their own text, to, to try to, to publish them in different versions, to get to meet these quantitative workloads and so on and so on, and it gets uh, worse uh, year, year after year. But this quantification of teaching excellence, uh, what it is called now, also, also allows the, uh, for, for another strategy of not only survival. So survival strategies are adapted to old-fashioned people who still believe in teaching as a, as a, as a profession, as an uh, intellectual uh, calling, who still, uh, who still see science or um, humanities as an end of uh, themselves, or let's say this uh, conservative old-fashioned old people, but there is also uh, there is also another uh, uh, another kind of people. I mean, uh, it, uh, to a certain degree, we are all internally divided between uh, managers, administrators, evaluators, and these old-fashioned teachers. Um, but there is also a tendency, uh, a sociological tendency, of a formation of a special of a special caste within the uh, or at least a special group, maybe case is too strong of a, of a word, but at least a special group of, of people uh, within the university, the institution of university, who focus uh, exclusively or almost exclusively on gaining, um, gaining this uh, uh, quantitative uh, uh, excellence, which are, and, and this group of people is also helped by the, uh, by the constant invention and the reinvention of new uh, possibilities of quantitative improvement of your own excellence, which go, which at least today go far beyond uh, teaching achievements or scientific achievements or uh, research uh, achievements, publishing of academic or uh, scientific tests, but also also expand to 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 administrative managerial areas and also areas of uh, basically to to put it short and simply. Uh, to areas of getting money into the house, so uh, getting getting research projects, uh, uh, filling out applications, and this this type of achievements um, uh, count in the same way, count in the same way as teaching achievements or uh, or publishing or research uh, achievements. So there is a there is a tendency for a special group to to form within the university. Uh, a group of people uh, who, who neglect uh, uh, teaching and research work or basic uh, scientific work and focus on this, uh, on securing both financial and administrative uh, power and, uh, and achievements. And these achievements are called special achievements without any explicit uh, cynicism or, or uh, irony. Uh, let's say achievements in uh, getting projects, uh, getting money, getting uh, getting um, uh, finance on on the market or from non uh, academic from non academic sources or international networking organization uh, management and administration and these people are increasingly uh, uh, increasingly taking control uh, private control over the sources of of uh, financing and also administrative control so. Uh, in order to preserve and, and uh, keep their administrative and uh, financial power and control, they, they of course uh, further the, the processes I, I sketched I uh, sketched before. So maybe um, uh, this is this is the, the part of the uh, university uh, about university as a whole from from both uh, student and teachers perspective of course in a very simplified uh, simplified uh, short uh, version now about the university and uh, society about the connection the, the relation between the uh, university and society at large or uh, not just economy but mostly economy because the 
the topic of the relation between the economy or the market and universities especially a uh, hot topic not, not only now but it has been for for uh, several years if not if not uh, decades i will also divide this part into two subsections uh, first uh, will be the relation between the university on one hand and the uh, labor market on the other and the second will be uh, the second will be uh, between the university and the uh, the, uh, the productive side, let's say the private enterprises or uh, the the economy as such. And then I will also add some remarks about the uh, university and non-economic part of the society at at large. So, so to begin uh, this part with the relation between the university and the uh, and the labor market. Uh, here, uh, a very, very, or at least in my opinion, the most problematic uh, trends and developments uh, um, in Slovenia include the, the repetitive attempts to, to introduce uh, tuition fees on, on one hand and to, to include uh, a so-called, uh, in the state documents, um, uh, state officials use from the Ministry of Science and Education use this euphemism of, of practice. We will include uh, practice in uh, both university teaching and uh, um, university administration. But what practice actually actually means, because uh, one would be a fool to argue uh, to argue against practice. So basically, it's an ideological uh, strategy. You cannot be against practice or criticize uh, criticize uh, practice. No, nobody really wants to. Or if you want progressive changes of the university, we don't really want to is isolate university from the wider context. So, so it's kind of tricky uh, when state officials start to talk, uh, start to talk about practice. Also, progressive lefty students and academic activists, of course, they don't, don't do not want to be against practice. But if, if you read uh, these appeals to practice carefully, we see that it's just an uh, just an attempt to to bring uh, to bring uh, representatives of the employers and exclusively employers into the university, both, both at the level of university administration and decision making, the university management, and on the level of uh, university, uh, university uh, uh, teaching. So basically the argument, which is also very evident, uh, uh, very explicit in the new uh, proposal for a, a new higher education uh, law in Slovenia, uh, goes goes something uh, something like this: uh, Young people come out of uh, university uh, unprepared for for the harsh uh, realities of uh, contemporary uh, capitalist capitalist life. They are completely uh, disoriented. They are unable uh, to 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 find to find jobs. Uh, they don't have contacts with uh, perspective or uh, potential employers. And they, they also don't have the, the right set of skills or sets of skills uh, necessary to succeed in this um, ca uh, late capitalist, very competitive and uh, flexible, uh, flexible uh, labor market. Therefore, we need to invite employers, this sounds like a humanitarian gesture, to help these pure, poor uh, dis disoriented uh, students. Uh, skillless and disoriented uh, students um, uh, to help them out of goodness of her heart. We have to invite people from, from practice, uh, practical people to our universities uh, to, to first and include them in the teaching process so uh, for these people to, to teach or at least take part in, uh, in the teaching um, so to input the right sets of skills in the students and then equipped with the right uh, sets of skills, they will come to the labor market and be able uh, to, to secure a job, to, uh, to land uh, uh, an employment. And also, uh, we, have to, we have to include them in the decision uh, making these people from practice, which actually means employers. We have to include them in the decision, decision making process. Uh, so, so they can tell us which skills are actually needed because there are people from practice. We cannot know uh, practice is a mystery to us, uh, regardless of our uh, scientific competence and achievements. 
uh, practices is a mysterium that can only be divined from uh, practice itself. Therefore, employers uh, uh, have to come and tell us uh, and also take part in the, in the designing of the uh, university curricula. So what, what will be taught at the university, how, uh, how uh, and, and, and in which way. So the argument concludes with uh, this, this, will make, uh, this will make young people employable. Now, now they are supposedly unemployable and because young people are unemployable they don't get uh, jobs. Uh, therefore, youth unemployment or social unemployment uh, uh, is, is on the rise. Basically, uh, what this ideo uh, ideological strategy amounts to uh, in, a, in a very, very subtle, quite sophisticated manner is to input uh, responsibility for youth unemployment to, to university. Uh, basically, it says it's university's fault that young people are uh, young people are unemployed. Therefore, something has to change. But this change cannot come from the university itself. Uh, it has to come from practice. So we have to we have to include uh, representatives of uh, employers in the uh, university as both teachers and uh, decision uh, decision uh, decision uh, makers. So. This is, I, I will criticize this uh, view a bit later, now, now I will just uh, present it, um, I've just uh, presented it, so now, now we'll switch to, to, the other, um, to the other, let's say, component of the relation between university and the labor market, which is the, this already mentioned repetitive attempts to introduce uh, tuition fees. Uh, as you probably already know, or maybe not, uh, um, the most of the at least first and second uh, uh, Bologna levels, levels in, of studying in Slovenia are free, free of charge. So there, there, is this, um, there is this strange and quite peculiar thing called irregular uh, studies. I hope that's the right English uh, translation. Uh, but it's, it's in actual fact it's quite uh, this degree of irregular study which includes tuition fees is, is actually quite, uh, quite marginal and it's been in decline uh, in recent years. So the, the latest proposal to change the higher university uh, laws includes, includes some, some limited, so it's not absolute and unconditional, uh, but still quite, quite problematic inclusion of tu tuition fees. And the, the logic of the argument for, for introduction of tuition fees uh, is connected with the argument for, for employability it, it goes something like this, if I again uh, exaggerate and simplify uh, uh, slightly, or maybe not slightly. Um, since education gives you uh, better employability, increases your chances to, to land a good job and therefore to provide for yourself uh, uh, financially, it is not uh, completely unfair or completely uncalled for that you have to pay for your studies because you, you will later uh, benefit. Uh, uh, benefit from it. So, so this would be, uh, let's say, the, the other uh, process connected with the relation uh, between university and the labor market. On the one hand, uh, attempt to uh, this, this very persistent, although yet unsuccessful, <coughs> but still very persistent, attempts to, to introduce tuition fees, at least in a, uh, in, in a limited, uh, in a limited partial, partial way. And on the other, to bring uh, employers to the to the uh, to the uh, university. Um, so I, I will now switch uh, to the uh, to the uh, relation between university and uh, the economy uh, as such, and I will uh, include, let's say, criticism or alternative view on on this relation in the last part of of my uh, presentation. So. The relation between uh, the university and uh, uh, economy, as such, here, uh, here the tendency is, and I think it's quite a maybe not universal or worldwide, but it, at least um, the tendency that I'm about to describe is at least uh, very familiar uh, in in European, in contemporary European uh, universities, because in this regard, if you compare the new proposals for the 
new higher education law, it is not much different from European Union or European uh, Commission strategies for, for a new innovative uh, competitive uh, Europe from these wider processes that were first coded in this uh, European-wide political uh, project of, of uh, Lisbon strategy and now they are part of, uh, of the wider uh, European-wide political project of Europe 2020 or two, 2000, uh, 2020 which replaced uh, 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 Lisbon strategy after its dismal failure to meet its target in, in, 2000, in 2010. It was replaced by the uh, Europe, Europe 2020 strategy, which has uh, basically very similar, uh, a very similar argumentation, very similar uh, political and uh, economic, economic uh, logic inscribed within it. Uh, which basically goes, uh, uh, its main argument uh, basically goes some, something uh, like this uh, because of not only a worldwide crisis and, and a recession which might yet, we don't know that yet, might turn into a full-blown depression and also because of uh, increasing, uh, increasing competitive pressure from um, non-European economies, especially from, from Eastern Asia, from, uh, from Northern America and also from the new uh, so-called rising markets uh, like Brazil and India uh, and so on. Europe can, simply cannot go on with its uh, old-fashioned welfare, welfare state models based on uh, relatively high taxes and relatively generous uh, state uh, redistribution of, of wealth, it has to become more dynamic, more, more competitive, it has to, it has to uh, update uh, uh, its, its economies, become more technologically, more technologically advanced, more productive, more competitive uh, uh, on, on the global market. So, so this, is, but this is a basic, let's say, basic uh, political economic uh, strategy of the European Union where university or higher education comes in uh, is precisely at the point of this supposed objective necessity to, to, to become uh, more, more technologically advanced, more, uh, uh, um, more productive. And uh, this is by way of uh, or at least the proposal and also a uh, very real uh, uh, political pressure uh, that, that goes downward from the, from the European institution to, uh, to uh, single national states and their ministries of uh, science, technology and higher education. Um, uh, the, the, where the um, higher education policy comes in is precisely at the point of of uh, innovation. So, um, uh, where where are those? If you ask if you ask the question, where are those innovations that will make uh, European economy and European economy as such more more competitive, more productive? Where will these innovations come from? The answer uh, the answer from the European Union and also from. Uh, a state official in a single uh, European state is from, from the university and from the uh, research institute. So, um, so to, let's say, subordinate itself to, to economy is presented as no, no less than a historical task or a historical, a historical mission of the university and research institute of utmost importance, of utmost urgency. Uh, because the consequences can, can be very dire, at least in the, in the rhetorics of the European Union and its, uh, let's say, local, uh, local national uh, representative, local ministers of uh, science and higher education. <coughs> if you do not, uh, if you do not uh, uh, reform the higher education systems, the, the science uh, systems in our uh, societies, uh, if you do not, uh, if you do not uh, implement the, the necessary reforms, if you do not make them uh, more uh, economically applicable, if you do not um, uh, make them able to produce economically useful innovations, uh, China will take us over or Brazil will take us over. Uh, our, our, economies, our economies will go bankrupt, so uh, we will be poor and marginal and, uh, and uh, irrelevant. So this is, this is the sense of 
uh, let's say historical urgency that that is being painted also uh, also in the local uh, um, in the local political documents regarding the reforms of the higher education and scientific research at least from the uh, 2011 uh, on if we if we switch to specific uh, Slovenian Slovenian case. The introduction are always uh, very, very dramatic, almost apocalyptic. Uh, in a sense, we have no more, than, we have probably less than a decade to become innovative, otherwise uh, 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 worldwide cataclysm, uh, uh, cataclysm uh, uh, will, will uh, follow. But what this, uh, let's say, what this apocalyptic rhetoric means in practice, in um, actual changes that take place in the in the university and uh, um, in the university and the research institutions, at least in my uh, opinion or in my analysis, the actual process uh, that takes place is uh, is that private companies, especially the uh, private companies that are engaged, uh, that are in the uh, uh, technological cutting edge of of economy. Uh, are trying to uh, to socialize the the costs of technological uh, technological development. So uh, companies that uh, that have uh, uh, that have their own uh, private research and uh, development de uh, research and development departments, which are paid for by their uh, by their profits by the money that they make on on the market selling their products. Are trying to are trying to uh, transplant this uh, this type of research and development, which is immediately, of course, immediately uh, economically useful uh, to, to to the university. So they try to uh, socialize the cost um, the cost of the specific economic uh, research and development, uh, but while still retaining private control over the the profits that come out of this. Uh, immediately economically uh, useful or uh, useful uh, research and development, but in order and they seem to have, um, uh, let's say this uh, this strategy seems to at least in Slovenia, but probably in other countries, European countries as well, uh, seems, seems to have a lot of backing within the state uh, institutions within the ministries, uh, govern ministries of uh, higher education and science governments and so on. But in order for this strategy uh, to be su successful, um, university has, has to make room uh, both, both physically and financially to accommodate this part of uh, immediately, uh, immediately economically useful research and development. So, so it's a kind of uh, zero sum game. So, in order, in order to to accept this new orientation, this new mission, uh, a public uh, university necessarily has to cut elsewhere. So, it has to uh, it has to make room not only in its curricula, uh, um, and not only in its uh, uh, management of of uh, teaching load, who will teach what for. Uh, for uh, how many times, but also in its financial plan. So, if it's supposed to finance this type of immediately economically uh, useful research and development, or, uh, or um, to put it another way, of the process of uh, um, technological application of uh, basic, basic uh, scientific research, it also has to cut funding or to uh, to cut funding uh, of other, let's say, other uh, autonomous uh, um, activities or practices, uh, both teaching and research at uh, university does, and I think that here we can make we can make the connection between the the demand uh, or this repetitive pressure to introduce uh, tuition fees. Um, uh, we we can understand it. We can understand this uh, pressure only, or at least uh, in part, if we take into account uh, this, this other process, this other pressure, uh, this other pressure for university to both financially and organizationally take responsibility for this immediately economically uh, useful research and the work of technological application of general uh, scientific research. So, in order to make room for this, uh, for this economically useful research, you have to cut somewhere. 
so so you have to get another another source of uh, financing. So maybe maybe this is an overstretch, but to uh, let's say if you simplify, we always have to over generalize. But I think I think we could, we could establish, or this this is up for a debate, of course. But I think we could establish on this very general simplified level, we could establish a, a connection between the need. Uh, to secure additional funding for this economical uh, research and uh, the diminishing of uh, uh, diminishing of funding in other departments, let's say in basic in basic uh, research, in the pressure to, to lower the salaries of uh, of uh, university workers, both, both <coughs> teachers and researchers, and on the other hand uh, the pressure to introduce tuition fees. So. So I think I, I still have to present the counter argument to argument for employability, but at this point uh, we can still uh, we can we can still say that students that the extreme cynicism of this situation is that students are being charged for the so, so by introduction of tuition fees it is students that are being charged uh, for the social socialization of the. Uh, 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 immediately economically useful uh, research, uh, research and development. Now the, the question, the question that remains is of course, but doesn't, uh, let's say, doesn't introduction, doesn't inviting uh, employers to the university increase the, the, the chances of, of young people getting employed? I think this is, um, uh, doesn't it, doesn't let's say, uh, orienting uh, university teaching more towards practice, towards the labor market, doesn't it really, uh, um, doesn't, doesn't it really uh, improve student chances of, of, getting, uh, of getting a job? Um, I, I think the, this, this, of course, this argumentation sounds very appealing. This is also the reason of its, kind of logically, the reason of its appeal. It's, it, it can be sometimes ha hard to argue against it or to criticize it, but I, I will attempt it uh, nonetheless, and I will start with a, um, with a very interesting uh, uh, paradox that we arrive at if we compare the, the, the latest uh, historical moment where Slovenia had uh, a full employment, so the latest moment in history where Slovenia still had uh, uh, full employment and today's situations uh, where when Slovenia has a record uh, youth unemployment which is around uh, or even over 20% uh, of the total let's say uh, the total young workforce under 30 year, years of age so between 18 and 30 years of uh, age so in the last um, moment I think this was in uh, late 80s or uh, in mid 80s when Slovenia still had uh, full employment the university teaching was very very traditional very very Humboldtian so uh, it, of course there, there was no Bologna reform um, and there, there was some orientation uh, towards the labor market but not in this, uh, in this pronounced way that is uh, taking place or uh, taking, taking uh, shape today. So basically in, in this, to, to make it short, in this uh, historical situation you, you, could, uh, you could study very, very classical humanities, you could study history or literature theory or philosophy and go out there and still get a job immediately. So, so I think, uh, and now, uh, today, uh, Slovenia never had so many career centers, uh, never had so many employers, both as teachers and administrative uh, personnel at the university, and, uh, and uh, uh, youth unemployment uh, reached record heights. So, so the, there, has to be, there has to be a glitch in, the, in this logic, in this argumentation, that more employers at the university will mean higher, higher youth, youth employment. And I, I think, the, I, I think the, the, the glitch or the problem is precisely if you presuppose uh, which most neoclassical economists and most uh, 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 politicians who listen to them uh, make that uh, the labor market is about uh, is about supply creating its own demand. So basically, what you need to do, uh, and of course, as neoclassicals tend to do, they always they always focus on individual 
uh, individual examples. So uh, what neoclassical economists ask themselves is what is the relation of a single young person uh, and a single potential, potential employer. And in this case it of course holds true if, if, you, if you limit yourself to this, uh, to this micro social situation you have a young person. Uh, you have a young person studying philosophy and wants to uh, wants to get employed in a pharmaceutical company, which is very technologically advanced and very practical and very unphilosophical. And of course, the employers say, uh, "I'm sorry, but your skills are uh, your skills are uh, irrelevant." But there. The, the problem with neoclassical econ economic theory and with the policies de derived from it is the, uh, um, it's called in the theory of implementation the, the fallacy of composition. You cannot extrapolate uh, a, a general social process such as youth unemployment by just generalizing this micro, micro social situation. But this is precisely what the political propagandists and economists when they act publicly as politicians or advisors to, to politicians uh, uh, politicians do. Um, so basically uh, my, my main point being that uh, supply does not create its own demand. There are, there are structural, there are general social structural forces at work uh, which precisely do not work in, uh, as, a, as an aggregate or as a, as a sum of uh, enthusiastic young people, each bringing their bag of human capital, uh, human capital on the labor market, and then landing employment just because they, they then they show their shiny bag of human capital, and employment magically appears. It, it, on a general social level, it doesn't it doesn't work like that, and the causes. Uh, this will be my uh, less critical point, and I will uh, proceed to this short sketch of an alternative. Uh, um, uh, this, uh, the, 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 the eagerness or on the general systemic social level uh, it is precisely the, the eagerness or uh, the entrepreneurial spirit or the, these shiny bags of human capital which young people bring to the labor market is precisely this that is uh, irrelevant so, um, so if, if you have a situation of crisis or, or a recession Investment levels will be low in the in the uh, private sector, in the private economy. So unemployment will tend to rise, uh, regardless of how entrepreneurial, skilled, and so on uh, the, the the workers are. So no matter how employable they are, they will still people will still be unemployed if there is a recession, if there is no money to invest, and if there is and if banks are, are unwilling to loan to, to businesses. So of course this is this is a completely this is a completely different problem of unemployment that has to of course be also be addressed and at a completely different level and my point being that university has nothing uh, has nothing to do with this the university did not cause the the, the recession the university also cannot uh, uh, give credit to entrepreneurs when. Uh, the banks uh, refuse it because of the, uh, the catch. So uh, the university cannot, uh, cannot solve the, the, investment, uh, the investment crunch and, and also cannot solve uh, the, the problem of unemployment in public sector because this is connected to a recession and unemployment, uh, unemployment uh, uh, in the private sector. So there is a recession in private sector the the tax the, the amount of tax come tax income uh, uh, which which uh, together uh, forms the state budgets also diminishes so the states also uh, have less money to work with so sometimes they, they react not necessarily there's uh, uh, there are other ways to handle this but sometimes also the states react by uh, uh, by firing public uh, public employees. And this, this is also a problem that cannot be solved uh, 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 in the university as an institution, but it can be, and this is now uh, my switch to the positive uh, uh, alternative, uh, um, uh, let's say, proposal. Uh, it, it can be theorized, it can be reflected upon uh, precisely within the university. So what, can, what the university cannot do, it is outside its uh, 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 social power outside this, its jurisdiction 
it, it cannot make uh, uh, people uh, magically more employable. It, it also cannot, at least in Slovenia, university is banned from employing because of the austerity measures. It cannot even do, do this micro, uh, micro correction of the labor market because it's forbidden to, to employ new people. Uh, at least in the moment in uh, in uh, Slovenia at the at the university, so not only it cannot make uh, young people more more employable in the general objective situation of uh, of economic uh, recession, it also cannot employ them them uh, themselves. But that it can offer at least in um, in its humanities, sociology, economics, and so on departments, it's a it's a critical perspective. That allows the, that allows us to to understand and perhaps um, to understand, reflect upon, and perhaps also plan uh, in our political, in our activist life, uh, uh, political changes that would be needed and which are necessarily out of the scope of university university uh, work. But to, let's say to to plan to to imagine changes that would be needed on this general. Uh, social social level that would uh, prevent unemployment. I think, and I think this is this is precisely the level uh, where university can can be socially uh, responsible uh, to to not enclose it. At least humanities part of the uh, uh, um, university can be socially respons responsive and responsible to not enclose itself in this. Uh, purely academic, academic ivory tower. It needs to, it needs to demand and also fight for, uh, fight for uh, uh, its its autonomy in a sense that it's not that it uh, precisely refuses any any guilt or uh, responsibility for the social processes that it's in actual fact not not responsible for. Because now now the relation is uh, now the relation between the university and the ministry is. Uh, uh, is, is basically guilt tripping. So the ministry is guilt tripping the university. Look at all, the, all of this misery uh, of young people. You cannot stand with your hands crossed. Uh, the times of academic ivory uh, tower are, are over. You have to, uh, you have to, you have to make these these people uh, more employable. And then, then in the in the background, there are people uh, from practice. Who are who are all too willing to to earn additional additional uh, additional and quite large sums of money to to appear as the employers' representative and saviors of this uh, unemployability unemployability problem. So everybody everybody is happy except again uh, teachers and students because not only that we do not understand or we understand very limitedly uh, what is happening, but this whole. Uh, employability, human capital, this micro individual perspective, actually it's not only irrelevant for the type of critical reflection that, uh, that uh, a university could provide to the society at large, but it actively blocks it. You, can, you, you cannot have both. If you, if you have this micro individual perspective, you cannot have structural perspective. It's not a question of academic pluralism. We will have one in one department or in one lecture course we will have this perspective and in another uh, 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 we have another. So basically um, university has to fight for, for uh, its, its uh, let's say, immediate practical autonomy in order to, to be able to provide this kind of structural or systemic critical theory or critical uh, reflection of society. It has to shake off this, this guilt and pressure, or at least um, in, within its realistic uh, possibilities. It, uh, of course, this, this struggle of course, depends on the strength and organization of the trade unions within uh, the university. It depends on the, the, the strength of, uh, let's say, institutional, institutional left, its presence or non-presence in the, in the parliament within the uh, state apparatus within the Ministry of Science and, and so on and so on, but within its, uh, let's say, realistical uh, possibilities, uh, uh, university has to fight has to fight against these attempts to, to be immediately useful, to, to become 
to become really useful or to become uh, to, to become really responsive and uh, responsible uh, to society at least in this um, at least in its let's say critical social theory type of way but this is this is of course not the the whole of the university this, this is just a, a very limited far idiotic uh, perspective of somebody who works at, in the humanities in the sociology uh, department uh, there's also uh, there's also a question, a very pressing uh, question, of um, uh, what about the other part of the university, the, the uh, technical or the the, the science, the, the natural uh, the natural sciences. I think that they could be, and this this was also uh, my proposal, which is. Uh, in, in the in the working uh, within this project, you probably discussed the, the project uh, the project of the writing of alternative or positive proposal uh, to to a new counter proposal to a new higher education uh, law law in Slovenia. Uh, one one of the ideas or proposal that that are circulating in the let's say critical academic student milieu uh, in Ljubljana is to uh, uh, to to not wholly refuse, I, I think it's kind of self self defeating and also very very conservative to uh, to to see university the autonomy of the university of some kind of self enclosed separate world. The thing in the case of natural sciences, this social responsiveness and responsibility could be uh, uh, redefined. Uh, precisely by, let's say, not only thinking about, but also practically, technologically developing, uh, uh, developing technology, technological solution, which would, of course, be innovative and uh, so on, but it will be uh, uh, in the service of public goods, so for example, uh, development of green transportation or ecologically friendly uh, transportation, transportation uh, systems, development of, um, let's say, uh, um, new new ways of building houses that do not use uh, so much energy, development of electric cars and so on. So uh, within within this process of critical thought and also proposals for, for social change, this could be this could be the the position of natural sciences and also technical departments, technical uh, technical uh, 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 faculties. Uh, um, so I I think I went for over an hour now. So I will conclude that at this point I had some more also more practical <coughs> proposals, but we can alternative proposals. We can come back to them in the discussion. Okay, um, so um, does anybody have a question or a comment? Yes. Um, yeah? So, um, when you presented the argument against specialized education and compared the situations in the labor market in the 1980s in Slovenia <coughs> and uh, the situation now, uh, don't you feel that you neglected to put in context these uh, situations of the economies in Europe and the new, as you call them, rising markets of India, China and uh, Brazil in that picture as well? Because you made a comparison between the mid-1980s and the situation uh, now and you said that in the 1980s the unemployment was at a record low while now it's, uh, what, 12%, the youth unemployment going up to 20%, but uh, would you like to comment as well on the economic situation of Europe in that period and China, since the pressures of this economic uh, period are different than those were in the past? Yeah, yes, of course. I mean, to, to have uh, full employment for, uh, for long periods, for decades, you need to have socialist economy. Um, uh, I'm completely aware of it, and it goes, also goes uh, goes the other way around. You cannot blame uh, the university for for high youth unemployment if you don't have socialist economy. This was the uh, let's say the, the the background background point. So you you, you could also formulate it <coughs> cynically, of course, in the hyper. 
uh, in the in the uh, hyper uh, competitive today's economy when socialism is a thing of historical past. Um, of course, you, you will have uh, uh, you will have higher uh, higher rate of unemployment, and especially in times of crisis, in the recession, it will increase or maybe sometimes even double from its uh, uh, regular amount. Uh, so, so you can reformulate it cynically, but I think this uh, this is still you can say this, these are the objective state state of things at least for the moment. And I I, I would completely agree if there are no changes. Uh, in the way economies in our capitalist societies are run, we will have to put up with misery and unemployment and uh, falling, falling standards. But the, I, I think the, the problem is uh, by establishing then these reverse links. Okay, there is misery and unemployment, university should do something about it. I, I don't think that university can do. I, I think it's only a society-wide coalition of, let's say, radical or progressive forces that can do something about misery and unemployment, but university can, can add a drop in this uh, small but not in, insignificant drop into this process by providing a space for, uh, for critical reflection or critical theory, theory of, uh, of society. But also, uh, uh, also we cannot. Uh, but I also think we cannot take this uh, China. Uh, uh, we have to destroy welfare state because of China argument. We cannot take it too far. Of course, uh, of course. Let's say automobile industry in Europe is uh, immediately competes on the world market with Chinese cars or Japanese firms that produce cheaply in China. So when, uh, so for example, when BMW or Renault puts their cars on the world market, they, they immediately compete with Hondas and Toyotas that are made in low wage uh, sectors in China. But this doesn't, this, this doesn't apply to to, to public uh, public sector and so on. Uh, uh, teachers in Slovenia do not compete with teachers in China in any way. That's quite a leap. So. Uh, you, there, there is no way to derive the argument uh, we have to lower teacher public employee wages in Slovenia because China. So there, there's also the element. <laughs> there's also the, the element of taking this China argument too far. Of course, in, in sectors in export export sectors of the private economy that compete directly with China, you, you cannot avoid the effects of this uh, this price uh, competition, but in other sectors, I don't think so. I don't know if I understood correctly, but I, I would disagree a bit. I mean, uh, you must lower teacher standards because of China. I mean, I, I think this is the most obvious thing. It's it's competition. For example, what you what you tried to say, at least the way I understood it, is that university is somehow not responsible for unemployment and so on. Yeah, okay, this this might be the case, but still university is a part of the system and the way things are done, of course, and this is, I think, the only way is that it presents, at least at this moment, a grave cost on, on the countries and the, on the public finances. So basically the only uh, reasonable way to, for, for, for example, for the politicians to go about is to cut the teachers' salaries, to uh, exclude more people for education, because there are no profitable ways of, of employing them, right? I think this is... Uh, I yeah, but, but still, um, reforms of, the, of education, of course there are cuts being made. I mean, <laughs> we feel them on, on our skin every day. Uh, but there are not. I mean, but still there is there is some. Uh, I mean, this this of course on the very very general uh, level, this logic holds not only because of recession, but also because of the increased competitive pressure on on uh, the world market, which is of course by by each each new round of. Uh, global economic liberalization, this, this uh, competitive pressure uh, also increases and also in the times of recession uh, state, state income uh, uh, diminishes uh, but this is not a completely total process I mean if it was 
uh, we could just roll over and die. I mean, it was a, it, if it was just total uh, objective, one-way uh, economic uh, determination, I think this, this type of economic determination is just uh, uh, shapes and by shaping also limits us our uh, area of action or our room room uh, for for action for intervention because um, in uh, let's say if we, if we go down or up to, to a more concrete level we can see that uh, there are of course cuts in higher education sector in in Slovenia um, but there, there are also large investments. I, I forgot the, the exact number, but when uh, uh, under Gregor Golovic, I think it was over 30 million euros uh, invested that was in 2010, 2011. So after the recession, there was more than 30 million, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, million euros invested in. Uh, in this, uh, in establishing this link uh, between uh, uh, high-tech cutting edge of economy and uh, uh, in uh, schooling, training uh, um, of uh, of people who could establish this connection in transfer from the economy to university and the other way around. So there were there was some quite large sums of money that could be invested and that could still be given different relations of political forces invested elsewhere or, or in another way or maybe in high technology that would be uh, generally socially useful not just for some limited sectors of the, of the uh, economy and so on. Um, so, so I think that there is, there is still uh, uh, some money, maybe it's diminishing, but there is still some some kind of uh, financial means which which allows some some room of maneuver of making things differently because there are also uh, um, new career centers new new entrepreneur incubators they are popping up every day so if situation would be just just total lack of funding where hands of the state are tight uh, it can just cut 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 there also would be no money to. To, to build new centers of excellence, new entrepreneurial hubs and so on, but they're still popping up every day. So, so money still comes from somewhere and that also means at least, an, uh, at least, means at least a logical possibility that given different relation of political forces it could be uh, reoriented to some other purpose. But this is of course very utopian, we are still very far from having that kind of leverage and power. Any other, other uh, yeah. additional questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, uh, you said that uh, we, uh, the university should fight for autonomy. Uh, but autonomy to do what? Uh, like to produce ideas or to produce, uh, let's say, political actions? Uh, because the way I see it is that a university today, for example, is the last uh, collectivity left. Uh, left. Uh, today, in, uh, in all environments, you don't have collectivities. You have people who do specialized work, totally individualized, automized, and so on. So, university is not only, in my opinion, the place where the ideas are produced, but also where the uh, collective actions are produced. So, uh, in the university there is a high, let's say, a political potential which can be exploited in order to produce also resistance which is necessary when we face uh, an attack, let's say, because the university and education and everything is under attack. Like we are saying, at least neoliberal avant-garde, ideological avant-garde is like uh, trying to, to, to go everywhere. So, the first thing is what to do to gain autonomy and to stay there because that bears the risk of being isolated from the society and uh, you just produce ideas, you may you criticize, 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 but then what? So that, that is, the, is this uh, what you are saying, this, uh, this uh, Kantian way of uh, university, you finance me and I produce ideas? Uh, I'm not understanding, let's say, the, the approach. What I meant was basically you you have to be autonomous in in this um, you have to be autonomous uh, um, 
or uh, let's say you, you have to um, disentangle yourself from this direct pressure to be economically or socially useful uh, in order to gain uh, some, some space, some, some breathing space uh, to be able to critically reflect upon, uh, upon uh, the, the society. Uh, I think this, this time, but I'm not, at least personally, I'm not against the social responsiveness or social responsibility of uh, the university. I, I, um, I find this connection uh, or this uh, uh, two-way responsiveness problematic when it becomes instrumental. Uh, when it, uh, in one way or another. So if, if university or at least humanities, social theory sees uh, the society as, as a pure object, uh, like a stone for geologists, uh, um, then, then it's uh, this, this way of instrumentalization from the part where, uh, where um, university assumes a position of subject of cognition and uh, society as uh, see society is a dead inanimate object of, of research and dissection, like a dead frog in American schools. Uh, so this this could be one way of instrumentalization. The other is of course economic economic pressure. So stop being smart asses and give us something useful. This this is the uh, and I think both both instrumentalizations are wrong, but. Uh, the, the whole idea or practice of, uh, let's say, communi communication uh, and mutual uh, reflection and uh, influence, I don't, I don't think it's wrong. But on the question of uh, collectivity and autonomy, uh, I pers personally think that one, one of the very important dimensions of the university uh, which are increasingly being de being destroyed today, or uh, I see it before my very eyes, is that um, there is there is no student life anymore, er, or at least it's uh, the type of collectivity that was being uh, that was being established in this, let's say, classical bourgeois Humboldtian uh, university, uh, allowed allowed young people some some years of uh, freedom. Let's say let's say it like that. Where, where they could uh, escape escape the, the repressive structures of the family and before they, they entered the or where they already escaped the authoritarian uh, personal domination of family relation but before they entered this impersonal uh, impersonal soulless domination of uh, market forces on, on the labor market but in between uh, you could live for a few years and I think this is a very important, uh, this is a very important uh, function, social function of the university, which is disappearing today because students have to work almost from, from day one. And if they are not working for money, they, they are working uh, at the university. They are like workhorses from one, from one assignment to another and from one lecture to another for eight, nine, ten, ten hours. So this this type of uh, and I think this is this is a value in itself. I mean, what kind of a society would not uh, would not allow its young people at least uh, to live at least for uh, three or four years. Uh, um, so this is this is the dimension of collectivity that I think it's not it's not immediately socially useful, but could be preserved as an as an autonomous uh, end in itself. Okay, thank you very much. I'm, I'm sorry we have to wrap it up. Uh, if any, any questions pop into your head, please keep them until uh, the afternoon panel and um, our guests won't be present, but we can discuss them there because we have to take a break now because we start with the afternoon part at 4 o'clock at faculty. Okay, now we can take your question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't putting any pressure. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, Professor, you said that uh, for a free and public education you need to have a socialist economy, but you say that uh, socialism is a thing of the past. It's been, uh, and we all know that most educated nations in the world are Chinese and Cuban and North Korea. So I am just interested in that contradiction that you said. How then we are going to win the free and public education if socialism is a thing of the past? No, uh, 
and it's not a thing of the past because uh, it's still uh, yes, it's. I mean, it's youth of the world, but it's uh, uh, leading to sting in lots of parts of the world. Yeah, I, I meant currently it is a thing of the past. I didn't, um, I'm sorry if it came off in, in this fatalistic way that, uh, that because of 91 uh, it, it is completely impossible. I, I think it's, it's, it's quite possible. Maybe, maybe not, uh, not in this real politic kind of way because we still have to solve this uh, pressing issue of what to do against, uh, against American drones because we're, we're, not dealing, uh, we're not dealing with white armies today but we're dealing with pilotless uh, planes and stuff like that which makes kind of old-fashioned workers uprising uh, I think this is really a thing of the past. You cannot just shoot them down with the rifle and so on. So, but uh, I, I think it's still, um, uh, I mean, it's possible, of course, on this very general uh, political level. Um, I, I personally would not want socialism to take shape of either <coughs> North Korea or socialism of the future of either North Korea or China, but this is a matter of uh, person. But it's a, it's a uh, just political preference. Yes, but it's a permanent thing. It's not communism. It's, uh, it's a permanent. I mean, the form that socialist power take in North Korea and China is just. A, uh, I mean, it's not communism. It's not an ideal thing. It's a part of the struggle that is still count leading. I mean, in China, the public sector is uh, dominated over the private. Although there are multi companies and stuff like that. And in North, North Korea, the, everything is in public. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, but <laughs> the North Korean example precisely shows that th things can be nationalized, but it can still be quite horrible place. So, I mean, you know, there, there is no police on the streets in the North Korea. They are spies. <laughs> exactly on the streets. <laughs> But the, okay, but that is not, we are not talking yeah. about uh, communism uh, in yeah. socialism in North Korea, we are talking about free public education. Yeah. And free public education now only exists in China, in Cuba, in North Korea, in uh, places where socialism is uh, on power. So uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, you said you were contradicted. You said socialism is a thing of the past and we can have free public education only in socialism. Yes, it is. Um, I mean, I still agree with that. I mean, uh, you, you can have truly universal uh, free of charge and so on, available to everyone, uh, uh, education only with the, with the really drastic general social economic, uh, economic uh, changes. So, so um, I, I, I mean, my point was being very orthodox Marxist, you, you cannot have a socialist infrastructure without a socialist base, let's say. This, this would be, to put it in a very classical uh, Marxist terms, but this still doesn't mean on, an all or nothing situation. You still, even even in capitalist European, let's say, to, 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 if you look short term or until we solve the drone question, this can take years or, or decades and establish full communism in Europe. Uh, there, there are still changes or adjustments that can be made. I mean, you, you can have a uh, university system like, like in Great Britain, where, where you have armed security guards and the only black person you see is handing you out your copies uh, because none, none of the students are, are black. Uh, and so on. So you can have this elitist, private, uh, uh, racist, exclusivist uh, type of private education. Or you, you can have, let's say, this uh, type of Danish, uh, Swedish, uh, which is almost uh, almost universal and used to be completely free for, for long uh, stretches of time. Uh, and, and I think this is, this is the, the real situation that we're dealing with, how to, uh, how, how to, pressure, uh, how to pressure the state in, in allowing, let's say, financially and organizationally, uh, to push in some, uh, to, to uh, if you limit uh, to, to push in some more progressive, uh, uh, to push higher education in some more progressive uh, way, uh, this is this is a question that faces us or a student or academic activists. It's it's out, uh, outside of our, at least while we 
act in the act in, in the role of students and academic activists. We we are basically trade unionists, progressive uh, progressive trade unionists. So so we want to push, expand our rights, uh, uh, improve in a reformist way our, our institutions. But then then if general worldwide socialist uh, revolution happens. Then, then fine, but we have to also act without this certainty. Yes, but you it's cannot do it without, that's the point. It's yeah, utopia. No, no. It's utopia. No, you cannot reach the, the final stage, but still there are better and worse. Of course, uh, you should universe. fight uh, within yeah. the capitalism, but you cannot, it's utopia to get free of public education. There was one guy, you said you don't agree with the Chinese model and stuff. There was one guy in China which think similarly like you, that there is that the economic base it's in, is, or socialist economic base, it's, it's not everything. And that guy was Mao Tse Tung, and he made a cultural revolution which led to destroying of the schools. Because he was, uh, the economic basis is not everything, uh, superstructure is a uh, thing that uh, uh, we can, uh, by which we can change things. And he started his cultural revolution, which led catastrophically, because he didn't make uh, made a, 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 a socialist economy, economy, but he made uh, uh, propaganda stuffs uh, and uh, you know like uh, thousands, millions of children coming into school and killing the director and stuff like that, like so-called class struggle. But uh, it's a wrong, uh, uh, wrong way, and it's also. Uh, you, of course, we should fight in uh, capitalism uh, for a better rights, but uh, it's utopia that we can uh, win and, and, and that we can preserve our rights in capitalism. It cannot be done. It can only be done if we fight to take over, the, to acquire the capitalism and make the socialist economy and stuff like that. So I think that uh, uh, we should go beyond that trade unionist consciousness, you know? I'm, I'm gonna have to cut it off. Um, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, no, it's it's cool. Uh, we will continue in in a good hour. I I suppose 4:15 at Faculty of Social Sciences lecture room number 21. We will have a panel discussion on organizing. Talk with our guests more how what they do, how they organize, and what some videos. So, tell us.